All right. So today in our second installment of the series, I want to talk about what you've been asking. What did I get myself into? Yes. You may be seated today. I just want you to ask a few people there. What did I get myself into? Thank you again, Taka, as well, for your spoken word and everything that she does. Wonderful. Um, you might not have ever asked that question, but I've asked myself that many, many times. What exactly did I get myself into? Um, we're talking about discipleship um, this month, and I want to talk about it um, all year, actually. We'll talk about it all the time, you know, so it will always be sprinkles of it, because if there's anything that God has really wanted us to be, it's not just good church attenders, but he really wants wants us to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to make sure our relationship with him is strong, and to make sure we know who we are in Christ, and that as we learned last week, a disciple means uh, to be a student of Jesus Christ. Can we say that today, that a disciple means <laughs> to be a student of Jesus? Say it again. A disciple means to be a student of Jesus, and that's what we really want to make sure that everybody knows. And what I was saying last week is it's important that we know what a disciple means because many of us are making disciples and we don't know what we're doing. Many of people are becoming disciples of us and people are uh, acting like us. And how I know that and how we know that is because people come in one way and that's talking about coming in one way into your life. And then over time, they start to act differently. And you can find out how who they are acting like by according to who they're around. And there are many times people start saying things and I'm like, that sounds Sounds like something somebody else would say, which means that they are discipling them. Many of us disciple our children. And how you know this when they when you're not around, they say stuff that you say. Come on, somebody. And they like you your mama's not around to hear you say that. You know, and some people it was always funny to me when your children would start cussing, they'd be like, I don't know where they learned that from. <laughs> They so messy. I don't know why they, you know, and it, it would be, and I'm very cautious. Uh, even as myself, I've been a preacher's child all my life. I always say that. And I'm very cautious what I discuss in front of my children. Uh, because a lot of times, um, preacher's children, I don't know about yours, but uh, uh, those of you who've not been preacher's children, but you hear too much information. And you start to judge people based on what you hear. And it's not very easy being a preacher's child because you live in this glass box and everybody thinks you're supposed to be perfect and all these different things and I, I am very careful because sometimes something might happen and I can't say you know so and so did and a lot of us do things like that and we talk very loosely around our children and stuff I'm not just talking about in the context of a pastor but in context of you being a Christian we talk very loosely and when they see that person you talked about they don't know how to take them because you're talking out of both sides of your mouth and it confuses them when you're in this church and you're like that's my brother and that's my sister but when you get in the car you say something completely different and I see people like that all the time who love, I love the pastor but then I hear something completely different in the streets but when you're around other people and it's very different for people to know how to really take you when you talk out of both sides of your mouth I got word for it you want it somebody say word and James says a double minded man is unstable in all his ways and some of you don't need a better shout you need a stabilization of your mind a double-minded man, you hop from church to church, from ministry to ministry, from relationship to relationship because you're unstable. It's not people. We need stable. I don't want to have a good church service. I want to be stable. I want to be who God says I am. I want to be stable. Anybody want to be stable? I just want to be stable. If they, they may not, I remember someone said to me one time, like they didn't have, a, they used to be in an abusive relationship. Now they were out of their abusive relationship. They didn't have the income that the abuser was giving them because they were married. They were no longer in their relationship. They said, I don't have as much as I used to have, but at least I have peace of mind. And there comes to a point in your life where you say, I don't have to know all the church gossip. I don't have to know the church stuff, but I'm just happy to be stable. I'm happy to be stable. Someone say, I'm just glad to be stable. So this message today um, is very important for us, for us to understand what it is that God is challenging us, what Jesus is requiring of us, and what he is challenging of us. Because many times we get around different encounters and get around different things, and we get around different experiences, and we make quick decisions 
is based on a feeling. Yeah. I really try to make sure that I um, try to um, encourage people not to connect and please don't think that I'm not a supporter of Growth Point because I am but I encourage people not to join immediately. Yes. When I say join, I'm not talking about joining, you know, you don't have to, this is not a club but I mean connect, you know, as far as in fellowship. I say don't because I don't want people to get connected to a feeling. Yes. I want you to get in a small group first. I want you to show up for prayer first. I want you to show up for some of our meetings and different things like that because I want you to see if we are who we say we are. Because you, if you get connected to something based off a of feeling, feeling will sometimes wear off in time. I was reading some stats the other day and it was saying that a lot of people are not looking for a friendly church. People are looking for friends. What that means is that friendliness can be manufactured. You can, when people say Growth Point is a friendly church, that's great, but I don't want to be manufactured. Meaning you can have people that are greeters and put people in certain places and they can put on a smile that might be manufactured and may not be real. You find out the real person when they're tired tire blows out when they're driving. <laughs> Ride in the car with them long enough and see if road rage rises up in them. Every, after they leave church, go, go to Cheddar's, go to J. Alexander's, go to a restaurant with them and see how they treat the waiter. Before you get connected, before you say I do first, ask how their credit is. <laughs> Before you say I do, find out how they treat their mama. Yeah. Find out important things because feelings, you don't need a feeling when you get sick. Yeah. When you're in the hospital or something, you need someone who's going to fact, you need a fact check to make sure somebody's going to be there for you. So I tell people not to join quick on a feeling because I want you to ride the tide a little bit to see are we who we say we are because of, some people who say God led me are the same people later on who say God led me to leave. Right. God is not schizophrenic. Right. Hello. He's not schizophrenic. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And you need to sit a minute and make sure that what it is that God is leading you to do, he can back it up. God is not a man. I didn't even mean to preach about this, but God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, he will confirm it. Tell somebody he'll confirm it. Whatever he's leading you to do, he'll confirm it. He'll start lining you up with the right people. He'll start putting right things in places and stuff. That's that's why I get uh, irritated sometimes when people post stuff on Facebook and they say this service changed my life and then by Friday they back in the bed. <laughs> Have mercy. <laughs> Because feelings can confuse you. Feelings can give you an arousal, but it doesn't sustain you or deliver you. But if you're really changed, you'll go to that joker and say, I can't do it no more because something happened in my heart. It ain't an emotional thing. It's a realistic. All right, praise the Lord. I get passionate about that thing. But I'm saying it's very important to us that we understand what we got into. That salvation and even the those of us who get baptized, we get baptized and then we think that's it. Or we get saved and we think that's it. Or some people join a ministry like this and we say that's it. I've joined. I don't do anything but sit. But there's something that God is requiring of us and we need to know what it is that he's required of us. So in this particular thing, I believe that there are four areas that we are tested in all the time. These are the four areas that I'm going to talk about that we are tested in in this scripture today. And I want to talk about that. Y'all want to hear it today? Are y'all ready for it? I said, are y'all ready? Ready for it? Yeah. I'm going to give it to you either way. So we're going to go four areas that I believe that God is challenging us in today. So I'm so grateful to, for this time to be able to share this with you today. So here in this particular scripture in Luke 9, it says that as they were going along the road, someone said to him, someone said to Jesus, someone said to him, he said, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, one particular version, I don't know if it's Mark or Matthew, that says that that a disciple 
came to him. That this is not one of the 12 disciples, but a disciple, and one, one of the commentaries said a casual disciple, came to Jesus and he said, I will follow you wherever you go. Now the background of this is that a lot of times after Jesus did miracles and after Jesus performed works, people would then say, because you did something miraculous, now I want to follow you. And that's what a church experience is for many of us because something miraculous and something emotional happens, now people say, I'm with that. I want to be connected to that because you got goosebumps on top of your goosebumps and it made you feel really good and your weed was getting lift off but you had it real tidy with a skull cap. So there was something that was going on in your body that couldn't handle the glory of God, praise the Lord. And you wanted to make a sudden move and that's what people do after they saw Jesus feed 5,000, after they see Jesus raise up somebody from the dead. They saw that and all of a sudden they said, I'll follow you wherever you go. So this person came up to Jesus. Jesus did not ask him to follow. But he came up to Jesus. He said, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus did not say good. Jesus did not say, come on. Jesus did not say good. Because a lot of people say stuff like that. When people say, I want to connect to a growth point. People are like, oh, good. We're so excited. I'm not any more excited anymore. Because I'm not interested in numbers. I'm interested in soldiers. Yes. Yes. We don't need anybody else to sit on the pew. We got that covered. I need somebody in the prison. I need somebody to go over there to the, the triple X store or something and grab people out and tell them, put the X's down and pick up the blood of Jesus Christ. I need somebody who's not going to be messy but Christian at the same time. I need somebody who's not going to be gossiping and lying and tweeting the secret text messages and that you will be able to grab people and say, let me show you something that has changed my life. I ain't concerned about numbers. I'm concerned about change. Someone say change. change. So Jesus wasn't excited. He had a response for it. He looked at the person. He said, oh, you want to follow me? He said, well, this is what you're going to have to do. He said, this is interesting. Jesus said, foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. He said, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He said, well, let me give you a test. He said, the first test, this is the first test all of us are tested with. He said, I want to test you in your lifestyle. He said, the first test is your lifestyle. He said, you want to follow me? He said, but how much do you love what you connected to? He said, because if you want to follow me, he said, foxes have burrows, or foxes have holes, and, and burrows are like, they are underground rooms, and they take their, their families into these rooms, and, and while they are being hunted, they take their families into these rooms where they're able to hide. He said, you want a room? He said, but my very nature, I am the son of God. When I was born, they couldn't even find room to birth me, and you want room and you want accommodations and you want the rich culture and you want it laid out for you but my mother who bore me and was carrying me for nine months couldn't find anybody that would give me a place they had to have me birth around animals are you ready to be born around dirty things are you ready to be born in stalls if you're not ready to be born in dirty things you ain't ready to follow me He said, you want an accommodated lifestyle. I didn't have any accommodations. You want to be born in riches and luxury. I was born in cow dung. He said, foxes have balls. They have places for themselves and their families. He said, but then birds of the air have nests. It means that they have shelter when they need it. Whenever the bird gets tired, it has a place that it can go rest. Whenever the bird gets tired, it has a place that it can nest and it can birth other eggs so that they can, and they can push them out when it gets ready. But every time I try to find some place to rest, I can't find a place. Everybody wants me to perform miracles, but nobody wants to give me a place to lay my head. He said, if you want this type of lifestyle, you have to be comfortable with feeling abnormal. If you want to follow me, if you want this type of lifestyle, you have to be comfortable with people looking like you're strange. You have to be comfortable with not being welcome to the party. You have to be comfortable with not being welcome to the stage. But if you want accommodation, this ain't for you. You got to go get yourself together. Yes. Yeah. 
This is real discipleship. He said, foxes have burrows, foxes have holes. He said, the birds of the air have nests, but I don't have any place to lay my head. He said, your lifestyle is going to be checked. Your lifestyle is going to be challenged. And some of you are not willing to allow your lifestyle to be checked or challenged yet. That, he didn't stop there. So after that, that's one thing. Somebody say, that's one thing. And that's hard enough. After that, he said, another one. Then that's, that person came to Jesus. The next person Jesus looked at and Jesus said to this person he said follow me I feel this all in my socks today praise the Lord he said to him follow me but Jesus said not Jesus but the, the disciple the person he was trying to disciple said well first oh hold on one second I want to thank God Mama Joyce was in the hospital a few days ago we're so happy that she's here today and that she's feeling well today so we want to give God glory for that I'm sorry. Someone told me I, I just interject stuff all times. I think that's the pastor of me, the country part of me. Anyhow, he said in verse 59, says another, he said, follow me. But Jesus said, Lord, not Jesus, the person said, excuse me, the person said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. The second thing you're going to be tested in is your identity. <laughs> First thing you're going to be tested in is your lifestyle. The second thing you're going to be tested in is your identity. He says, let me go first bury my father. Jesus said to him, he said, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, what does that mean? Some people say, well, Jesus wasn't concerned about my family. He was, the guy was saying, he says, I want to follow you. He said, but my identity is connected to what I'm kin to. It's very difficult for me to be in a new environment, in a new setting, when everything I know birthed me. So let me go back and have consultation with my family first. Let me go back and get permission from my daddy first. Let me go tell them what type of ministry I'm going to be connected to because you told me we're going to have no place to lay our heads. We're not going to have any nest. That means we're going to be poor. And I've got to go tell my daddy. I've got to tell him what I'm getting into. Because my identity is what I'm familiar with. So the reason I'm nasty is because my daddy's like that. The reason I'm not a good father is because I've never seen a good father before. <laughs> the reason that I am like the way I am is because my identity shows me that's how I was going to be. And I've never been anything more than what my identity said that I could be. So I'm not sure about following you yet until I first look at my identity first. Yeah. I don't know how to be faithful because I've never seen faithful in my life. I don't know how to attend. I know how to attend church, but I don't know how to be a disciple because I've never been discipled before. No one's ever sat me down and told me to get myself together. They just told me how to get in the choir. They told me how to be an usher. They showed me how to be a parking lot attendant. But nobody told me to get my character together. No one taught me how to be generous. Nobody taught me how to have good relationships. They showed me how to sleep with everyone. But no one told me how to abstain. I've never seen a healthy anything in my life. I have never seen healthy leadership. I have never seen a healthy church. I have never seen a husband love his wife real. I've seen them post, but I knew what was going on behind the post. I've never seen it really in my life. I've never seen it real. So you're telling me to drop everything and follow you, but my identity is messed up. My identity is confused. Am I preaching to anybody today? My identity is messed up. So you're telling me to follow you, but everything I know is not good. I'm used to men going in and out of my mama's house and I don't know any of them. So when she tells me to be faithful to somebody, I'm like, but mama, you weren't faithful. 
My identity is tied in that. Yes. Hallelujah. So he says, let me go bury my father. Now, this is what was more interesting is that commentary say, Matt, it says that his father was probably still alive. He said, let me go bury my father, but his father was still living. Don Trees, I, that confused me. Because a lot of us want to go connect to stuff and wait until it dies. It's already dead spiritually, but I just want to wait till it dies naturally. And a lot of us stay in relationships longer than we're supposed to be in relationships. And we stay in friendships longer than we're supposed to be in friendships. It's been dead before you buried it. But you're waiting for the last breath to come out for you to say, oh, I think it's over now. I feel like deliverance is happening right now while I'm talking. Ain't no music, ain't no oil, but it is coming to a, a graveyard near you. He said, let me go first bury my dead, my father. He said, my father's not dead. But what he was saying is he's going to die. And when he dies, he might have an inheritance for me. And there are some of you who you think that even though it's a bad situation, you think your bad situation is going to eventually change. You, you, you make it seem like a, a princess and the frog. Like they eventually going to kiss you and turn into something that they, 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 they just got a spell on them right now. They ain't got no spell. They're a frog. That's why they keep hopping from you to her to her to her to her. They're a frog. And this is a little froggy situation that you need to get together. I know I'm preaching better than you're looking. Facebook, holler at me and tell me, preach, black man. <laughs> So he said he could have had a challenge, but then Jesus, when Jesus said this, Jesus responded, and Jesus said, leave the dead to bury their dead. He said, this is what's challenging, Shalom. He said, leave the dead to go bury their dead. He said, but you go preach the gospel. That thing ministered to me in a way, I'm trying to tell you, if I could preach it the way I want to, I would double in size right now. He said, I feel like Professor Clump, and I feel like his mama like, Sherman, Sherman, Sherman. Sermon. That's what I feel like right now because it's all inside of me. And I'm trying to get it out. I'm sorry. <laughs> he said, he said, you go leave the dead to bury their own dead, but you preach the gospel. What he's saying is you might have problems at home. You might have problems disconnecting from where you've been, but I called you to preach. I called you to preach. When I call you to do something, I don't ask you what you connected to. When I call you, that means disconnect from whatever you connected to and do what I tell you to do. You're always going to have something going on at home, but you need to learn how to preach through it. Minister through what you're going through. For all of us who keep saying, I'm going through so much, that's why I can't be used. You got to go through and still be used. Sing with tears coming down your eyes. Pray with pain in your body. Fast and be hungry. But do no matter what, do not drop the call. He said, bury that. He said, but you've got to preach. I've called you to minister. While you are waiting to bury something, somebody needs to be saved. Yeah. 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 Why are you making an excuse for the relationship that you're in that ain't going nowhere? There's a sister who's looking at you trying to find out how to be a good woman, but she can't be a good woman because you can't tell the truth that what you're in is not working. They waiting on you to bury your dead and it's already been dead. You got people that you're around. You got friends that are around that want to follow you to church, but they don't understand why you like dead stuff. They see you promoting growth point, but they see you living in dead stuff. And it's confusing to people when they see you living on Sunday, but dying Monday through Saturday. 
It's confusing the people when they think that having a church friend is going to be their best friend, but then they get the best friend, and the best friend turns into Mr. Jekyll and Mrs. Hyde, and they're confused because they said the world was like that. I didn't know the church was like that, too. Dead stuff. He said, I called you to preach. I called you to minister. And for some of you saying, I ain't no preacher. All of us are ministers. How do I know this? Because people quote what you say. You are preaching with your post. You are preaching with your Snapchat. You are preaching with your Instagram. You are preaching with your YouTube channel. You are preaching in the sheets, actually. That's why people want to get in it all the time. Because every time they get in it, they come out with something. That's what preaching does. It gets you something. The idea is, but are you preaching them to Christ? Or are you preaching them to be messed up? I know I'm preaching it here today. He says, leave the dead to bury their all dead. He said, but you preach the gospel. Someone say the gospel. The gospel means that's the good news. People need good news. They need people who want to change. But they can't change until you make up your mind. People can't change because we were, my wife and I were driving today, we were leaving the gym, and uh, we were seeing somebody, and it sometimes, I, I think about, I see people walking sometimes, and it bothers me, and I know we're living in a day and time, Mr. Jeff, where you can't pick up everybody, but sometimes I just feel that pull, you know, I'm just like, you know, I want to pick them up. So I was driving with Darius one day, and we saw some people walking, and, and I was going to pick, he said, daddy he said, can you pick them up when I'm not in the car? <laughs> So I decided not to pick them up that day. But today I saw the same people. I said, they're the same people. And they were dressed in, you know, church clothes. Well, you know, you can tell when people are going to church, you know. And so I said today, I said, man, the same people. And I didn't get them last time. I'm giving this time. So this time I was coming back. I turned around and went back to them. And I went to them and I pulled up. And I said, hey, um, I said, you going to church? They were like, hey, yeah. <laughs> And I said, uh, I said, would you like me to take you to church? They said, no, exercise. I said, oh, okay. Because they were African. I didn't know that they were African until they started speaking. But what, for them, but had I not done it, I wouldn't have known that they didn't need it. And there are some of you who you won't even ask, does anybody need help? And you don't know if they need it or they don't need it, so we just drive past issues and never say anything. But it's better for you to ask, are you hungry, and for them to say, no, exercise, instead of you not saying anything and walking by and never knowing. You cannot tell me that there aren't at least 10 people in your phone who you need to invite and you need to minister to, but you're too scared to do it. You can't tell me that. I don't believe it. I don't have, I don't, I can't think of anybody I need to minister to. You can't think of anybody because the first you got to minister to yourself before you minister to anybody else. And if you're not ministering to yourself, you can't minister to anybody else. But once you minister to yourself, you got a right to tell somebody. When somebody loses weight, you better believe they're going to post and say, I used to be this side, but look at me now. And what he did for me, he can do the same thing for you. Nobody loses weight and goes undercover. Christians are the only people who get saved and then duck and dive. I'm like, I ain't saved. What you talking about? People lose weight. They were, I'm telling you, it's summertime. Just go out to the beach. Stay out there like I used to wear. I used to wear one piece, but baby, I got the two piece on now. But now everybody who gets saved, you can't even find a Bible in the house unless it's Gideon's. Now, I don't want to ask you where you got that from. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Y'all help me. Pray for me as I grow strong in the Lord. He says, you're always going to be challenged at home. He said, but your challenge is to preach. And I got a scripture to even make this even more challenging because people are saying, well, this sounds really harsh. It's not harsh from the sense of you need to find your identity in Christ. This is what this scripture says. I got this scripture for you. Luke, the 14th chapter. He goes further. Jesus said, if anyone comes to me, hear 
this, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sister and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Hate is such a strong word. He's not talking about you disrespect them. But what he is saying is, I love you, mama. I love you, sister. But I love Jesus more. And what I'm saying to you, that this is not a family plan. This is not a family discounted insurance plan. This is my own personal decision that I made to follow Jesus. And if you don't go, and if you don't go, I have made up in my mind that I'll go if I got to go by myself. I love Jesus more. Somebody say, I love him more. If you don't shout, they don't mean I won't shout. If you don't run, they don't mean I don't run. If you don't forgive, they don't mean I don't forgive. Just because you told me to hate on people doesn't mean I'm going to pick up that bad trait. I love Jesus more than anything who does not hate his mother, his father. His sister, and you say things like, well, my father's in church. My mother's in church, and you can be in church, but not in Christ. Woo, Jesus. I feel like jumping in this baptism pool myself. I'm saying you can be in church and still not ever have a relationship with Christ. Be in church for years and never change. Sit here, nod your head, say hallelujah, rotamanteresha, all of those different things, and never give your life to Jesus. How I know it is because I've seen it. Some of the nastiest, most rudest people I know, Usher. Not here, not at Grove Point. They are the nicest I have ever seen. Give a shout out to our personal touch, our greeters, all of them. Because I don't want to start no riots up in here because I'm losing weight and I can't fight y'all like that. So I want to make sure, and mama told me never put my hands on a woman. So I want to make sure y'all give them a shout out. They're doing the best job. Hallelujah. But I have gone to some ministries and they are the nastiest people. Y'all seen them? It's probably your granddaddy. You know, they come to the church. Scoot down. Uh, scoot down. Can we bow our heads in prayer? Amen. They are so mean. And I'll be sitting there and th then they quote, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. I'm like, you ain't in the house of the Lord. I want to say, who let the gate open? Lord to Jesus. <laughs> so that means you can learn church, but never be in Christ. And that's what I'm trying to teach, that we don't want to just be in church, but we want to be in Christ. Someone say, in Christ. In Christ, my identity is in. Not in the church, not in the pews, not in the structure. I'm learning to be in Christ. And sometimes being in Christ contradicts the identity that I had in my family. Yes, it does. Yes. Sometimes being in Christ, I have, it, it hurts more than I love it. Yes. Can anybody say that? Yes. Because we're living in a day and time right now that preachers would love to make you feel good. But I told the ministers downstairs that the gospel will make you mad sometimes. The gospel will challenge you. The gospel will make you do things you don't want to do. And it'll be like, you got to do better than that. But you know, those people want to feel good. You got to go to, to, to go to Kings Island or something so you can be amused. But the gospel will get yourself together. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So that's verse Luke. Let's Luke 14, 26 uh, says that. And then the next thing after that, and I'm almost finished here. After that, it says, is this ministering to anybody today? I hope it really is. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can. I am. He says to, to another, he said, follow me. He said, let me go bury my father. Verse 60 says, he said, leave the dead to go bury their own dead. But as for you, you go and proclaim the kingdom to the world. And then in verse 61, you would have think they got it. Verse 61, he said to another, he said, he said, follow him. The another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first go say farewell, farewell to my home. Now, one verse he was talking about his father. This verse you would think he's talking about his, his, his family. But in further study, he wasn't talking about his family. He said, in this one, he said, let me go say farewell to my family. And what, just farewell to my home. And what he meant was, let me say goodbye. This is the last, next thing you'll be tested in, in my friends. Yeah. Yeah. I'm tested in my lifestyle. I'm tested in, in I'm tested in my identity, and then I'm tested in my friends. He said, "Let me first go say farewell or say goodbye to my home." And there are some of you who got just this one part twisted. Some of you think that to give your entire life to Jesus means giving up your friends. And that's what you've been taught. And we give word for it. We say, you should not be unequally yoked together. Oh, I can give you word for it and what we say. Because we use it to twist the scripture. And we say all these different things that light can't be among darkness. And you know your friends are pulling you back. And you can't be friends with them anymore. When he called you, he called you out of darkness and to his marvelous light. And we do all these different things. Y'all better tell me I'm preaching. I know I am. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. We say these things. You better come out of darkness and come out from among them and be ye separate. And y'all know what I'm talking about. Facebook, you know that's why you go and log out. You better not log out. You know you're the one who said it. We say these things. Come out from among them and be ye separate. And what happens is you leave your mission field. You don't have to go to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. You don't have to go to Africa. All you got to go is to a neighborhood near you. Fire up the grill. They all show up every time. And they say you strange. Because the church taught you to leave them. But nobody taught you how to affect them. Lord, I feel like running to the whole pew and walking pews up in here. I'm saying to y'all, he said we always tell people to leave, but we never people tell people how to affect. Yes. Yes. How could he tell you in one scripture to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, but then tell you to leave your friends too? What he meant was you cannot any longer be influenced by the world. Because if you are going to be the influencer, you've got to be the salt. They are living a flavorless life. And they're looking for you to add the flavor. But if you leave them, you have no opportunity to influence them. You cannot influence what you're not around. You cannot be light if there is no darkness. And I preached this one time before. Many of us have learned how to be other among other lights. I was at Brother Matt's house. Uh, the men, we were there. We had a great camping trip. We're going to do it again one day once my back gets together. But we had a good time at, our, at the camping trip. But uh, there's lightning bugs out there, lightning bugs out there. And what was interesting is when you're in the city, you can't see lightning bugs. Because there's a whole bunch of lights. But when we got out into the country, the darker it got, the brighter the light. 
The darker it got, we said there's so many lightning bugs out here. The thing is, they're everywhere, but you can't see them if there's a bunch of lights. And there are people that you're connected to that are living in darkness, but they are wondering, can anybody shine the light on their life, but they can't see the light because we're more comfortable together. We're comfortable having church talk and not dark conversations. When is the last time you sat by somebody who smoked weed and you didn't join in? I'm just going to sit there right there for a second. When is the last time you invited them over and you told them to leave and you can't stay the night here? If y'all don't say something, I'm going to think I'm in the wrong church and I'm going to think you're guilty. So you might as well say something like, word, yeah, you can say it, preacher. I'm telling y'all, when I was in college and I was wrong, I'd be like, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, help me. You better preach. Don't get quiet. I'm saying, when was the last time that you were at a function and you didn't walk away drunk? When is the last time that you heard something about a church in the city and you didn't add to the conversation? Some of y'all are looking at your nails. Don't look at your nails. Look at your heart. When is the last time? I know I'm preaching heavy today, and I know some people log out like, he be coming for you. I'm coming. I know I'm coming. I'm coming in a Honda. I'm really coming. But there's some people right here that I'm saying that many of us, when we hear things about things going on in the church, instead of us turning down the volume and saying we need to pray for them, we join in. And then we send screenshots to confirm what we heard. He said, I'm not telling you to leave your friends. I'm saying be an influence to it. Every last a majority of our church, some of you other than those of you who are first time church attenders, those of you just now giving your life to Jesus, but there's some of you, all of you came from somewhere and from somebody's church. When is the last time that you prayed for where you came from instead of doubting where you came from? And saying they're a mess. Why don't we pray for them? Because it affects the entire body of Christ. He said, let me go say bye to my friends. And what he was saying is, I'm going to say bye to my friends. Because if I continue, if I live a sold out life, you're not going to let me have no friends. And some of you have been taught wrong. You think there's no fun in Christ. I, I wish I had an organ. I wish I could preach, but I don't. I feel like I need to teach some. I need to unlearn you. Yeah. That was probably the worst English ever. But I want to unlearn you. Look at someone say, "Unlearn it." Some of y'all think there is no fun in Christ, so all you do is go to conferences. You take vacations just to go to a church conference. I'm. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If I go on a vacation, it ain't to a pulpit. It's to a beach near you. And it ain't going to be no post. But I'm going, I ain't going to a nude one. But I'm going somewhere where I can have a good time. Look at someone say, have a good time. You don't need to go to another church convention. You know how to do church. You need to learn how to live your life. We manipulate people and tell them the only life you got is in Christ. No Christ came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Go to a movie. You don't have to watch Fifty Shades Darker, but you can find something that you can watch that you don't have to repent for. But some of you, if you can't do what you want to do, you don't want to do nothing at all. Jesus came to change your identity, so you're going to have to learn how to do it better than what you were doing it before. So if you don't smoke now, find out something else to do. Play cards. Yeah. Yeah. 
Saints don't play cards. The devil's a liar. I love Uno. We lie and we say these things to people to control them. So because you can't drink anymore, you don't know how to, to have a good punch or something. We're just like, I don't do this. I don't do nothing. I stay away from all of it. No, he's not telling you to stay away from it. He's telling you to influence it. Learn how to be around it and not become it. Learn how to see your ex and not still want your ex. Preach, Mario. I will. Stop allowing it to rise up in you every time you see it. Something just comes over me. Well, let him come over you instead of him come over you. And then you regretting what you did. Control that thing. So look at someone and stare and say, control it. The Bible says that he who cannot control his spirit is like a city without walls. Get an alarm system on it and say lockdown. <laughs> I don't know what to rate this message today. Y'all pray for me. Y'all praying for the pastor. I'll, I'll tell y'all. Giving him my mind. Y'all pray for me. We often believe that Jesus doesn't want us to have friends, and that's not it. I love having come. My, one of my friends, my cousins, actually, he's actually connected to this church now, my, my, uh, my wife's side. And when I first met him, the very first time I met him, because all I knew was church. And um, my family is considered, I guess, you know, suburban, upper class church people. <laughs> You know, I ain't never been around hood, you know, until growth point. But anyhow, so, so I was used to being around other people who had everything right and the English and the, the education, all that stuff. And then I got with Mel, and then, uh, <laughs> So, um, and I blame it all, all on Gwen. It's all Gwen's fault. But anyhow, so I um, went to, um, I introduced her to my family, you know, you know, had a, and my friends, you know, she had to make sure her tire was right, you know, for that, all that. So then when she had me meet her family, I said, where are we going? She was like, what's the East End? West End? What is it? <laughs> South End. South End, but it was like a bull line West End, too. But anyhow, so I was down there. <laughs> ain't no shout outs to those of you who live on there. But anyhow, but I was down there at South End, you know, and um, when I walked in, you know, and Katie, like, what's up, nephew? You know, all that. I was like, what? Like, how you doing? We, we all shake hands. I mean, I was just like, okay. And then her cousin, who is a, who connects to, connects to the church now, he was sitting on the couch, sitting there smoking, you know, weed. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mother Higgins. This, I'm not trying to. I'm just saying what it was. So he's sitting there smoking. I'm like, all right, how you doing? <laughs> hey, you know, and then he's sitting down. It confused me because he was sitting down smoking weed with grandmama's Bible open. I'm talking about grandmama's coffee table Bible. The one that has the funeral programs in it. The ones that got all the marriages in it and all the deaths in it. That one. Y'all know that one. So he's sitting there smoking, and then when I sit down, he said, um, let me ask you about the history of the church. <laughs> smoking. <laughs> let me ask you about this scripture right here, Job 4. He just started talking, I was just like, it's because in my church mind, I had already judged him. <laughs> Yeah. 
church mind, I'd already judged the situation and said the situation was beneath my church self and he needed Jesus. But when I left the conversation, I wanted to go back and study and say he knew more than I knew and he was high. And I'm saying that you're disqualifying people who know more than what you think they know and the reason you don't talk to them is because you don't know what you don't know. He had talked to many other pastors before me and said that he couldn't talk to pastors because they shut him down and said that he was weird and strange. But I was the first person who did not judge him and listen to him. And this cousin of mine was ushering with the men a few Sundays ago. Don't you tell me God ain't somebody. If you would take your church mentality and sit down and go to a hood, let them smoke and learn how to minister to people and stop speaking in tongues and learn how to get high on Jesus. That's discipleship. Discipleship does not judge. Discipleship gives people room to grow. I walked away more impacted, not by the high. (laughs) Now, I did walk away like I feel good. (laughs) I was like, we can go visit any (laughs) time. That's how I felt, Mel. Don't judge me. (laughs) But there's some of us, you would rather be around other church people and talk about churchy stuff. And ain't nobody impacting anybody. Nobody is changing. No one is being impacted. Because we are doing is just transferring information back to each other to see who is the deepest among us. I know I'm preaching here today. My time is up. I got to finish here. And the last thing, the last thing in verse 62, he said, he said in verse 61, he said, I won't go say farewell to my home. In verse 62, he said, no one who puts his hands to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. He said, nobody who puts their hand to the plow is fit for the kingdom. This is the last thing you're tested in. Many of us are tested in eternity. After you get through doing all this stuff, he wants to know what are you going to do with Jesus? He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. And what that meant was, no one who says they're going to do something and then turns around and does something else is fit to be my disciple. He says, many, this is the thing that many of us challenge. I'm finished here. Many of us get challenged here. Many of us say, I don't want the world anymore. But you haven't necessarily let go of it either. You say I don't want to go back. But you haven't disconnected from it yet either. I don't drink anymore. But the bottles are still in the house. I ain't with him anymore. But he's still in my phone. He says, nobody who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit. Now, those of you who are farmers, there's probably no farmers here, I don't know. But if there, if those who are farmers, when they had to till the ground, they would get their eyes set on something at the end of the field. And they would till the ground. And they would focus on what was in front of them the whole time they were tilling. The entire time they were tilling, they would keep their eyes focused so that they would have a straight line. If they were to look back, they would have crooked lines. But they had to keep their eyes focused on what was before them. You want word for it? I got word. Somebody say word. Here is the word for it. Philippians 3.13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended it all. But one thing I do, I forget the things that are behind me and I reach forward to those things that are before me. I press. Press is not easy. Press means you got to go against the grain. 
Press means people won't always like it. How do I know it's difficult to press? Here, come on, come on, woman, testify real quick. This woman had an issue of blood for 12 long years. She had went to many physicians and couldn't get any better. She got worse, but she heard that Jesus was around. And when she heard that Jesus was around, the woman said to herself, I will press myself through this crowd. And when you're really ready for change, you will press through your issues to get to him. When you're really ready for change, you will press through your identity to get to him. When you're really ready for him, she said, I will press through. He doesn't have to acknowledge me. I just want to touch him. And it says that when she touched him, Jesus immediately stopped and said, somebody touch me. The church people said a whole bunch of people are touching you. He said, oh, no, 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 no. This person who touched me pressed through something to get to me. And I want to know, is there anybody here today that pressed through anything to get to church today? Is there anybody who pressed through anything to sit in the seat that you're in today? Is there anybody who pressed through anything to have your right mind today? They tried to mess with you. You wanted to clock on a lot of people, but you pressed your way through anybody pressing. Look at somebody say, I pressed through it. I press through my family. I press through my issues. I press through my finances. I press through my co-workers. I press through my son. I press through my friends. I press through my cousin because I love Jesus and I had to get a touch from him. And the only way I can get a touch is if I press through it. And according to my press, he acknowledged me. And there's some of you that you haven't got healed because you're not desperate enough. But when you get desperate, you'll press through something. You'll look at somebody and say, excuse me, I'm tired of this life. Excuse me, i got to be better. i got to press through it. Look at somebody and say, i got to press. I press toward the goal. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what's trying to mess with my mind. You don't know what's going on in my house. You don't know what's going on in my marriage. You don't know what's going on in my children. I'm pressing just to be sane. I'm pressing just to praise. I'm pressing just to worship. We ain't got no musicians, but I'm pressing my way. I'm pressing through my agenda because I need a touch. I'm pressing through it. Somebody say, I'm pressing through it. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. That means he's raising me up from where I was. He's raising He's raising me up from what's trying to kill me. He's raising me up. I can't die because I'm being raised up. I feel like that's a press praise real quick. Can somebody just open their mouth real quick and give them a press praise? Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you for letting me clap my hands. Thank you that I got out of the hospital. Thank you that I got out of jail. Thank you that I don't have any diseases. Thank you that I'm here. Thank you for teaching me how to press. Oh, I thank you for the press. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. I love the Lord because he heard my cry and he pitied my every groan. I would not have cried to him unless I went through anything. But the more I went through, the more I pressed. The more I was attacked, the more I pressed. Thank God for the attack because it taught me how to press my way. Yeah, yeah, Bashaya. Learn how to press. Everybody stand on your feet. I gotta stop. Thank you for the press. Thank you for the press. Thank you for the press. You thank God for the job. I thank you for the press. It was the resistance that made me who I am. You won't even play, but the resistance. Mel and I were working out this morning, and I looked at her, and I said, why is it that I'm running faster than you, but you're gaining more, you're losing more calories than me? She said, it's all about my resistance. 
and there are some of you who you are sweating but you ain't losing nothing you are sweating but you don't have no victory you've got to up your resistance stop rebuking the devil and say come hell or high water I'm gonna press though he slays me yet will I trust him I'm gonna praise him I'm gonna glorify him because of my storm it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn who he is gotta press my way Oh, sure. I got to press. Learning how to press. He said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit. Every last one of those people were interviewed and none of them passed the test. Why, Lucian, did they not pass the test? They couldn't pass the test of lifestyle. They couldn't pass the test of identity. Couldn't pass the test of friends. Couldn't pass the test of eternity. And Kim, all of those words lead up to one word. Go to my next screen. They would not give him their life. All of us are tested in L-I-F-E. He said, you can't follow me and not give me your life. I don't want your church attendance. I want your life. And if you're going to follow me and be a disciple of mine, you've got to surrender your life. Everything belongs to me. Jesus said, I come that you might have life. I'll give you more than you ever thought you could have. I'll do more than you ever thought you could imagine. But you've got to deny yourself first and give me your life. Everyone lift your hands up.